Yes, I, <laughs> I like the boat tail car, and I like the cord. Now, when I'm talking about the boat tail Duesenberg and the first cord, I was 12 years old. And um, I had made acquaintances in Detroit of all of the showroom on Jefferson Avenue. And um, I'd walk in the showrooms and talk with the dealers and talk with the salespeople. And they'd tell me all about the cars and I'd sit in their new cars and so on. So I was really interested. Now, additionally, my family never owned a car. And for, <laughs> for a young character like me, uh, and when I first saw the cord, I thought it was a supercar, but I didn't understand the round ball in the front, which was a front drive. And <clears throat> I didn't understand that engineering at that time. Well, you know, I was only 12 years old. But I had already gone through all of the dealerships, every single one of them, and uh, collected brochures and so on. But family never had a car. My parents were from Transylvania in Romania, and uh, they came to this country in 1910, separately married here. And um, so my mother was the keeper of the budget and we couldn't afford cars and we could use the buses and the streetcars and transfer and good enough for her. My wife, my mother always said no. I bought my mother-in-law's Pontiac. I would guess that it was about a 38. And I bought it in 41. And um, I bought the car and your mother bought another car and it's burned more oil, I thought, than gasoline. And every time I'd go into a gas station, there'd be a big plume of smoke trailing me. And I said to him, no, just call me Smokey Joe. This is my Pontiac. I need some gas. <laughs> no, when I started work in school, I did not have a car, but um, I stayed with a family that our family became acquainted with in Detroit. And the oldest son worked at GM as a commercial artist. And on the way to school, he'd take me to school uh, because it was in the same building where he worked. And uh, he taught me how to drive. And then I bought a car soon after we were married about Betty's mother's car. But I didn't dare tell anybody in school that I didn't have a car, nor my family ever had, never had a car, and that I couldn't drive when I first went to the school. We were in a classroom of about, uh, I'd guess, probably 20 in the class. And in the classroom, there were students that were in different periods. In other words, we were not all in the same grouping. Some had been in the school for uh, two semesters. That's two periods. And um, when I started. And um, so those that started with me, one of them was Elwood Engel, who and he became a friend of mine in school. And uh, so we were working, some of the students in the classroom were working on different projects of the car. <clears throat> the beginners in the first semester did the front ends. Second, second semester, we probably graduated to doing the whole car. And uh, then advanced cars. and interior and exterior. Um, that's the way it was broken. And then these uh, portfolios we turn out uh, during the semester. 
the designers from GM would come in, the head designers, and look at our portfolios, and our portfolios would go to the GM building, and they'd review them in detail, so we never knew what they said about our work. But those that didn't pass got a pink slip, and those that went ahead got 10 bucks increase. And we started the school at $75 a month. That was in 39, late, 39. And each month, 10 bucks increase. Well, that month paid my 40 room, $40 board and room, plus gave me $35 to date Betty. <laughs> and um, she was earning more than I was. And she was a full-fledged designer. And I was still going to school. And um, that's, that's what it was like. But I went, because of my industrial design portfolio, which was very strong at the time, um, they tried me out in the uh, industrial design section. And there I stayed about three to four months and they put me in advance. And uh, there we did advance models and advance ideas and advance full-size clays. And I stayed there probably another three months and, and they shipped me to Cadillac. And um, there in Cadillac, I worked on facelifts of Cadillacs and new Cadillacs like for the following year, brand new, design-wise. And the studio also did full-size clays. So I learned an awful lot in the Cadillac studio working with Bill Mitchell. So when I went to engineering, I had four years of engineering then under my belt. And when I started out at GM, I started out as a layout man. And then <clears throat> at the end of four years, I was a senior layout man. I didn't start out as a layout man, I'm sorry, I started out as a draftsman. Low key, down the bottom. And uh, worked myself through the drafting and started on layout work in about a year and senior layout man at the end when they said, we want you to stay with us. Oh yes, I was very excited. I was so excited I couldn't keep a uh, from smiling constantly. Bill Mitchell finally said, you better wipe that off, Joe, that smile of yours, because you're going to have to prove yourself in this department. He was a outspoken person, but I liked him, and uh, we got along real fine. And then when uh, I got let go, he, he got madder than a wet hand and called uh, the engineers at Cadillac and said, you know Joe? Oh yeah, we know Joe. Well, this is what happened. Well, I sent him right over. Half hour. Another job. I had three points. The first one was that <clears throat> I always wanted to have my own business in industrial design. I thought that'd be wonderful. And um, I thought if I'd start with a name designer in industrial design, learn the business for about two years, then I'd be prepared to hang up my own shingle. Additionally, I also noticed during the time I was in design at General Motors, prior to engineering in Cadillac, Ford of War, that there was an awful lot of competition, which didn't phase me, but I knew it would take me a longer time to climb the ladder, salary-wise, <clears throat> etc. And that was number two. And number three, I never forgot my strange happening with Harley Earl when he asked the uh, whole design office to go up on top of the roof at GM building and uh, look at a couple cars. And when we got up on a roof, Mr. Earl said, now we want, I want all of you young fellows to speak up and don't be bashful. 
and uh, we'd like to know what you think about these cars. So after looking at all both cars, a four-door sedan and a two-door sedan, I finally went right to Harley Earl and I said, Mr. Earl, there's only one thing that I wish we could do to the four-door sedan. And he said, what's that? And naively I said, I wish we could take some of the feel of the sporty two-door and apply some of that on the greenhouse and apply some of that aesthetic feel from the greenhouse, the roof panel of the two-door onto the four-door. At which point Mr. Earl immediately straightened up and called out for Jules Andrade to ask him, who is this man? Which he did. And uh, when Jules came, I saw Jules and uh, Harley Earl huddled for a few minutes and I thought, well, there goes my GM job. But then after the huddle was over, why, it was over and, and I went back in the Cadillac studio. Um, and Bill Mitchell at the time said, well, that shouldn't have happened, Joe, but forget it. So after my stint at, uh, well, I'm a little ahead of myself here, but I'd like to say that we got in the studio and Bill Mitchell said it shouldn't have happened. Short time later, Harley Earl came in the studio and uh, saw me working on the blackboard on the front end for the ensuing year. And he liked what I was doing. And he said, well, that's sure another way to skin the cat, isn't it, Joe? And I, at that point, I said, yes, sir. But I didn't enter into too much conversation with Harley Earl because I still had in my mind my, uh, uh, my tangle with Harley Earl up on the roof. And so I kept it all very businesslike. <clears throat> well, during the war, I moonlighted for Sunberg and Farrar in Detroit on some jobs like refrigeration and things of industrial design. I had never moonlighted for George Walker. However, <clears throat> in George Walker's office, there was another graduate that didn't graduate in class with us, but had gotten his degree um, after he graduated a short time later. He left the school just prior to graduation. His name was Ted Ornus, and he also was an industrial designer in our senior class. Ted joined up with George Walker, industrial design office, uh, during the time when we were still seniors in art school. And um, I talked with Ted um, about the time that I was ready to leave GM. I said, and Ted told me that he talked to George about it. And uh, so Ted Arnes, working for Walker, arranged the meeting for Walker and I to meet in his office. And um, that was my first introduction to George Walker. However, we hit it off very well. And I kind of kidded Walker later on in years that we both went to the same high school and both graduated from the same art school, but we did different things. And um, so we hit it off very well, and he doubled my, gave me a job and offered me a, an increase to the job I had with the Cadillac Engineering by doubling my salary. And um, working for Walker, I started out in industrial design jobs, because when I interviewed with him, he said, where is your car design? I understand you were with Cadillac Engineering, and and uh, you work with Cadillac Engineering and you were in Cadillac Design. 
working on the cars? And I said, yes, I was. And he said, well, where are your cars, Joe? And I said, well, George, I didn't bring any cars because I wanted to get into the industrial design. And I said, I'm most anxious to do that. And we laughed about it. But he, he liked what I had shown him and he doubled my salary from Cadillac Engineering and I started in with Walker in industrial design. And I uh, handled um, industrial design projects for him, about three or four of them. And one was uh, in Baker Hall Lang in Cleveland and uh, Eureka Vacuum Sweeper and uh, Cockshut uh, Tractor in Canada and um, B.F. Goodrich uh, um, Tires, Akron. And so I, I had my hands full. And slowly, in the uh, studio, Walker also had, of course, the Nash account at the time. And the fellows working on the Nash account uh, would ask me, because when I'd get by, we'd see their work, and they'd see what I was doing. They said, well, Joe, what would you do with this project? And I said, well, I, I think I'd do it this way. And I'd sit down and knock out a sketch. It could be a front end or a detail or some, something to do to a body or something or other. And I wasn't realizing that Walker was watching me because it didn't take me long before I was getting tangled with the fellas on cars. And I didn't know that Walker, I'd, I'd crumple up the sketches and throw them in a the wastebasket. I'd leave them on the desk and they'd throw them in a the wastebasket. But I didn't know that Walker was going to the wastebaskets and picking out the sketches and looking at them. And pretty soon he turned me on to the Nash account with the other man who was Kurt Whitkey at the time. And uh, before long, Nash asked that Walker put me on, make me responsible for the main uh, portion of the stuff coming design-wise from the studio and gave me the responsibility to uh, oversee the development of these ideas with Nash. So I got back into cars a short time after I was with Walker. And that's how I got started. And about a year later, Walker received a request from Ford Motor to compete with the Ford Design Office, a contract to compete for the design of the 49 Ford car. Because they wanted a new car since Ford decided that the car that was supposed to be coming out as the 49 was too heavy and too big to be called a Ford. It would compete with Oldsmobile or Buick, but it was too big to be a Ford. So with that car competing as a Ford, Ford would have lost their shirt on that car in holding the size car that it was. So Ford was invited to contribute designs for the 49 Ford. The 49 Ford designs came out of our design office in New Center Building in Detroit, <clears throat> and I contributed a lot to it. And uh, the designers in our uh, studio contributed, and the other primary designers, of course, were Kurt Whitkey, and of course, um, Elwood Engel. Elwood Engel was contributing, um, and another a fellow was, um, Bert Trombley was contributing. And so between the three or four of us, we were contributing to designs. And Walker also had uh, designers from outside contributing. 
He had the Grissingers contributing, Reese and Grissinger contributing from outside designers. They were a separate new industrial design group. And <clears throat> additionally, a fellow came to see George by the name of Khalil. And he was with Studebaker in Indiana at the time. And um, he was let go or about to be let go because they were cutting, retrenching. And so he wanted a job with Walker, but Walker didn't give him a job, but gave him um, money, hired him to contribute ideas for the 49 Ford. So there were outside people in our own design studio at um, Walker's office contributing ideas. Khalil came in with a car that was a plaster model. It was beautifully done. And Walker had finally a big show uh, for Ford management to select a car that Walker would be doing full size. And the car was to be done at Ford Motor because we didn't have the facilities. And that meeting was held in Walker's office. I was not privy to it, just Walker and the Ford people. And the car that came out as the car to be used by Walker was the Khalil model that came to the office uh, from Indiana. Now that Khalil model uh, was our base to start with. At that point, uh, we started at the, um, our design work in the engineering building, in the same building that Ford Motor had its design department in, in engineering. And we were just given a different section of the same building. And our two sections had uh, guards posted outside their doors so that neither we could see what the Ford was doing, nor could the Ford group uh, under Bob Gregory see what we were doing. And uh, the car uh, was started in clay and Walker asked me to take that quarter size model and bring it up to full size as close as possible to that quarter size model. Now, when we started, the, that was my responsibility, uh, directed by Walker and Elwood Engel uh, was my assistant on the project. And of course, Elwood, we met in uh, the GM school and I was also Elwood's and we became fast friends and Elwood and I uh, went through the school at the same time, same class, and I was also Elwood's best man when he married. So we were rather close. So Elwood and I, and I brought Elwood into Walker's office. Elwood was in the service and I corresponded with him while he was in the service the full time. And one of his last letters he sent me from Europe was, he was debating himself whether he wanted to go back to GM or go into industrial design. At that point, I rushed the letter back to him and I said, well, I'm working for George Walker in industrial design. And I told him all the things that I was doing, cars and products and so forth. And I said, you'd like it. And if you wish, I can arrange a meeting for you, which I did. And that's how Elwood was hired at uh, Walker's. And uh, so both Elwood and I were assigned to the studio at Ford Motor. I was to run the job. And because of my four years of engineering, I was the natural one because I had all that engineering back of me and Elwood was in the service. So 
Our modelers were supplied from Ford Motor. Additionally, Ford Motor supplied us with an in-studio contingent of engineers, of about three or four body engineers, and that was the makeup of our studio. Now, as the model progressed in clay, we found out that the small quarter size model uh, outshone our models that we prepared in our studio considerably because the car was about inch and a half to two inches lower. They cheated on the package. So they cheated on the overall height of the car. They cheated on the overall height of the hood and everything, and it looked a lot racier. It was a good looking car, as I said before, but that was an advantage. And they also had an advantage. It was plaster and our cars were clay and sprayed paint. But this car that came in was plaster, high polished, and it was beautiful. So as the car progressed in full size, with the engineers in the studio supplied by Ford, we had to adjust it. So we raised the car about an inch and a half at least, and raised the cowl height accordingly, and the deck we weren't aware of their package entirely, but we had to fit milk cans on vertical in the trunk. So that established the height of the car deck for luggage. Today, luggage is put in horizontally and just make sure you get the golf clubs in. <laughs> but then it was um, under those um, ground rules, we had to put in the small delivery farmer's milk cans that went to the dairies for pasteurizing. So that's the way the car started. It did not have a spinner front end. It had a horizontal uh, grill bar. The car was shown to management after we'd made all of the corrections for the package and it was painted a uh, light tan. And um, the car was approved with two main criticisms over the Ford prepared model that was done under the direction of Bob Gregory and his designers. Um, the Ford car that Walker uh, had um, developed was approved in the body. Everything forward of the windshield was not approved and the back appearance of the Ford car was not approved. The back end was thought to be too tame and didn't have a strong enough statement. The front end they didn't like because it didn't have a strong statement and they wanted something more dramatic. So in order to keep the engineering supplied because it was a late starter for a 49er, the body was approved to take all the engineering points and then we were asked to come up with another front end. At that point, I made some sketches and I showed them to Walker and I told George that I'd like to start a spinner front end. And of course, I started a variation of the spinner front end for one of the early accounts that I had bird dogged on the Ferguson tractor. <clears throat> and and uh, so I first used it on the Ferguson tractor, but not exactly the way the spinner was done on the Ford car. And Walker saw the sketches and I told him that uh, I felt the front end would cool because it was very similar in the curvatures of the surfaces of the center hub, the spinner and the cowling so that the air would slide over the center hub and accelerate to the core, more in keeping with the, some of the work I had done on the tanks, where we created sort of a venturi on, on the tanks, air intakes that were used for fording. 
So George thought that was great. Go right ahead and start it. But I said, George, if I may, I don't want to put it on the car because I understand that the engineer doesn't think it's going to cool. So I said, George, what I'd like to do is put it on a buck from the windshield forward and we'll start another front end for the car itself. So we'll have two front ends to go by. In case Ford Motor doesn't like the spinner front end, then at least you'll have another one on the car. But if I put it on the car, it'll be an uphill battle because the engineer doesn't think it'll cool. So George said, well, that's fine. Why don't you do that? So I put then the spinner front end on a buck from the windshield forward and modeled it. And we did, Elwood and I did another front end, which we put on the original approved car that was now running, but we put then another front end on it, horizontal type. And Elwood Angle designed the back end, redesigned it by turning the vertical headlights horizontally and trailing the lens so that it disappeared into the quarter panel to the rear door as a big wind split. And this was sufficient to add a lot of interest to the back end of the car. The front end, when it was shown to management on the buck and the show was on, they never even bothered much to look at the car with its horizontal, new horizontal grille, but they immediately went for the buck and said, now that's what we want. And they approved the spinner front end with one condition. The condition was, we approve it, George Walker, with the condition that it will cool. Because the controversy was still raging. And, um, and Ford management got wind of it. Sheet metal was hammered out to simulate the clay that we'd prepared on the buck. And it was put in the wind tunnel and it cooled like a charm. And that was then the end of the controversy. The chief engineer shortly afterwards left the engineering responsibilities. Dick Khalil was a, a designer that oddly enough was a designer at Hudson Motor when Betty was working there. He has a long history he never had a uh, full uh, design training. He got his job at car companies and he was with Studebaker, but I believe he was let go at, at the end. And then he was preparing this car at his home with Studebaker, my understanding all of this, uh, Studebaker designers and Studebaker modelers, and they, they put the car together in Khalil's home. First of all, I have to just put it in perspective. War had ended. All of the designers that were in the war were all gung-ho airplane designers when they left the service. All the designers that were not in the war were also gung-ho airplane designers, and they were applying airplane themes to car design. This was also done uh, in um, Studebaker's, um, and um, that car that you're referring to, the nose of the hood the whole hood nose came out to a point and the center of the point was uh, a round theme was not exactly a spinner like what was on the Ford, but it was a big blunt type thing on the hood. I'll show you what it was like just to bring a sketch. It's not a, 
I didn't even put it in here, but it's one of those 1940 early designs. I can't do it. Okay, okay that's all we'll right. I'll tell Betty. We'll come back to that. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> come back to that. And, but uh, so what that, happened was it is not like that. And it's a um, thing that all the designers, it wasn't a coincidence, but all the designers were doing spinner type grills. And I was doing it also when I put it on the tractor. Well, that was the reason uh, they, one of the big things they wanted was a distinct statement to the front end of this new car coming out that would say, this is a brand new generation. This is Henry Ford's first car and he wanted to make a dramatic statement. At that point, I said, George, I think a spinner front end would work and I showed him my sketches which I was doing at the studio at Ford's then, and uh, he said, do it. That was pretty much take off from the, um, the original blue model that Khalil brought in. So the basic concept of the doors and the basic concept of the greenhouse stayed. However, on the greenhouse, we had to make changes, as I said. We had to raise it to be a four-door. Additionally, Ford Motor wanted to use the same greenhouse panel to the drip line for both the Ford two-door and the Ford four-door. So what we wound up, and I'll show you the photographs, we wound up by adding another panel inset from the drip line forward to the four-door cut line to accommodate the four-door door. And then for the two-door, that was left off. But we used the same greenhouse for both the two-door and the four-door on the 49 Ford. Additionally, on the, uh, so the, we changed the blue model radically from its uh, plaster point because that was shown without this panel. It was an entirely different idea. But basic concept of the body, its slab side, was retained. We add one detail for engineering in order to button the inside door trim panel and the exterior panel we raised a little belt line at the base of the glass line to the door section of about five-eighths of an inch, place where they could button it up. There was, before I leave the Ford car, I also designed the instrument panel for the 49 Ford. Okay. And that when I also sold to George that we ought to do a panel that was related to the exterior so that it would be part of the whole feel of the car, as if we could take a cluster and put it in a big circle and put it behind the steering wheel. It would pick up the ec and echo the front end spinner, front end grill portion. And that's how we did the um, uh, interior instrument panel. Now, that was my idea, but Elwood and I collaborated then on putting that whole panel together with all of its buttons and so forth and so on. Basically, it was mine. I'll take you from 49 and through, if I may. Okay. I'd, because... You have to keep it fairly brief, though, because... Okay. You try, try and hit the highlights. I I'll hit the highlights. Okay. The um, completion of the 49 Ford Walker ended his contract with Ford Motor because he was only given a contract to design the winning car. When he did that, his job was finished. And we were all disappointed, so was Walker. And uh, we were then, after the car was completed, we left. The contract was finished. And George said, well, we did our job. That's what we were paid for. So we went back to designing products and um, I started on some small cars 
uh, to do for Walker immediately. Uh, that would be post-war, uh, very small cars. And um, this was done for Fred Mathai in Detroit. Um, however, before the year was up, Ford asked this, Ford asked Walker to come back to Ford as a consultant. So we were out approximately one year. At the end of that year, we went back as consultants. As consultants, I went back and we were written up in the contract that be George Walker and his two designers, Elwood Engel and Joe Aris and, and Walker. We were in, written up in the contract. And that um, I was going to, according to Walker, service the Ford Division line of cars and trucks. And Elwood was going to service and concentrate his time in the Lincoln Mercury Division. And Walker was the overall uh, consultant. And of course, he'd sp speak with management. And we went back to work and stayed as consultants for about eight years. In the interim, one of the first cars that we were responsible then after the 49 Ford was the 52 Ford. And the reason that Ford was brought back, according to Scuttlebutt, was that during the one year period that we were out, the new hirees that were hired as designers from GM were hired to change the facelift of the 49 to the 50 car, and they tried desperately to get rid of the spinner theme and didn't succeed. Finally, they added, in order to do a derivative 49 into 50, they added the parking light change to the grill, and they changed the deck lock on the deck, and that was about the extent that they did to the 50 car. And with that, they also hired Walker as a consultant. So I was responsible then for Walker's office consulting in Ford, car and truck, Elwood and Lincoln Mercury, although we dovetailed. And we'd uh, spend most of our time at Ford. And that's where I spent my time and so did Elwood and Lincoln Mercury. However, we'd see Walker during the week once or twice. We'd certainly be on the telephone with him uh, many times. And so he knew completely what we were doing, and he'd come in on occasion uh, to see how everything was going and talk with the designers at Ford Motor. The 52 car was the first one that was all new at which point George said, Joe, you know what we have to do now, don't you? We've got to get that 52 card, uh, 52 car as our car, as consultants speaking now. And Walker was looking out for, you know, continuing his relation with Ford Motor. And uh, would you start a 52 car in the Ford studio? Our contract read that we could start new cars in the Ford studio or any studio, Lincoln Mercury studio, or we could consult with some themes and give our opinions, and if it could be done, fine. Or if it was impossible, if it was too far along and our suggestion was too drastic, we had the option of starting our own models, both Lincoln Mercury with Elwood and myself in Ford. So George asked me to start a new model in the Ford studio for the 52 car. That car started up, and at this point, there was a lot of competition now in the studio because consultants were now starting a brand new 52, and it was in competition with what was also going to go 
in the uh, competition from Ford. Well, needless to say, our car that I'd started became the 52 car. Management still preferred it. And as a result, I also continued with the spinner front end theme. I felt that it was good enough for the 49. It really brought in the people in the showrooms all over and the 50s and the 51 and the 52 should continue. I said, just like the Mercedes, etc. and I named the cars with George and George thought it was a good idea. Why don't you run it? And so that's how we started our run of the spinner front ends. We ran the spinner front ends to about the 57. At which point uh, we knew that Chevrolet was going to come out with a very radical uh, Chevy and so we changed our front end as well. We got off the spinner front end. Additionally, um, this was out and now on the 57. During that year, we also did two things. We, we had a Fairlane 500 series with a different body quarter panel. Had an upswing fin that came off of a, a large tail light. And uh, we also had uh, a straight fin for the custom in 57. So we had a difference there body-wise in, in the body detailing. That year also, with our 57, we were able to um, beat Chevrolet in sales for the first time. And our goal, of course, Henry Ford's goal was to endeavor to catch up was GM and hopefully pass them someplace in sales. Well, we finally succeeded in 57. Additionally, as the years went on, the tail light started to grow. On the 49, uh, on the 52 Ford, I added the round tail light for the first time. And Louis Crusoe was the vice president for division. When he saw that tail light, he thought it was a little bit large. And the reason I added the, the large, larger tail light was to get the afterburner of the jet engines um, that had influenced all the designers of the United States and Europe uh, with aircraft themes. So I wanted a, an aircraft theme to the back end of the car. We had an aircraft theme on the front of the car uh, at one time and also the headlight detailing on the 57 had a deep bezel. So I thought, well, that deep bezel on the front end of the 57 Ford car with an afterburner feel to the tail light would give it a nice jet aircraft quality. However, when Louis Crusoe saw it, he thought, oh, that's too big. Why don't you reduce it some? So we reduced the tail light on the 52 Ford five eighths of an inch from where he saw it, what came out in production. Well, that five eighths wasn't that drastic, but it appeased Louis Crusoe, so it stayed. As the years went on, this, this tail light kept growing and growing. And finally, I talked to George. I said, George, I said, we have on our car, the feeling of the round taillights. And we were starting to get in competition with GM on show cars. I said, George, I'd, I'd like to see us put these round taillights on the back end of a car that looks just like a jet. And I said, there is such a car in one of the advanced, in the advanced studio at Ford under a designer manager Gil Spear, I don't know if you know of him. Gil Spear, you've heard of him, okay. Gil Spear, I said, has a car in his studio, uh, three eights, that has a, a jet air exhaust. And uh, we ought to try a show car with this kind of a feel to it. 
if we don't try it, I said, General Motors is going to do it, and then we're going to have a heck of a time saying we were the originators of this theme. And George said, okay, start a full-size show car. So we started this full-size show car. We took this three-eighths of Gil Spears and made some modifications to it, but launched off of that car for starters, and it turned into the X100. And that car uh, was driven by Henry Ford and uh, for the longest time, and finally he got out of it because it was felt that it was such a showstopper on the road that it could cause an accident, and nobody wanted to have Mr. Ford in an accident. So the car is still a runnable car, and is it in the Greenfield Village? But that idea of the large car stayed, and the largest it got was on the 40, on the 49 Ford. 59. Ford, no, I'm sorry, 50, 50, 40, 59, 50, 50, 59 Ford. Yeah, a 59 Ford car. Uh, jet exhaust. And I said um, to Jim Wright, who thought it was too big, I said, no, Jim, it isn't too big. It's in good proportion with the back end. And I know it looks large to you, but it's, it, it's really great. And it launches off of our X100 as well. Of course, that's in bumper stock. But this had Jim Wright quite concerned all the way to the end of introduction. At introduction, when the 59 was introduced, that car also, that year, we were fortunate in beating Chevrolet again. And not by a big margin, but enough to claim that we beat them again. So we beat them in 57, we beat them in 59. Um, then we also, of course, put the round tail lights on the original Falcon, which came out in 60, 61. And the, the three small cars by the industry were the Falcon and the Corvair by General Motors and the Valiant by Chrysler. The Valiant and the Chrysler didn't even come close to the sales of the Falcon. But uh, of the three, Corvair was second Falcon was always first until the last year. They came out, uh, GM came out with a sporty Corvair with bucket seats. That uh, took a lot of sales from the Falcon, and that started the idea of a Mustang. Now, but before I get to that, I'd like to continue on the Ford cars for a while, and we'll come back to the Mustang. From the uh, 1959 Ford, the competition, after we successfully um, won the accolades and sales again in 59, was getting a little more competitive. Cars were beginning to grow um, in size. Um, there was the macho field of bigger engines, longer cars, and the cars themselves were growing in size. They were also getting a lot more chrome use as the years went on. And what was happening was that the cars as they grew, they all grew together as a family. So the small Fords and Plymouths and Chevys were growing because the Pontiacs and Oldsmobiles were growing, and it was happening throughout the whole industry. Everybody was in this growing bigger car, and the gasoline was cheap. It didn't matter whether the cars were growing and the weight was increasing, and you weren't getting the fuel economy because the gasoline was cheap as dirt. And so everybody was having a ball, and the war was over, and the euphoria 
was still growing uh, for a larger, more uh, sumptuous, more luxurious car. And the luxury crept all the way down to the Ford and the Chevrolet and the Plymouth. Everybody was trying to make their cars just a little prettier, just a little bit more roomy, just a little bit longer, just a little bit more important looking. So the cars were increasing in size. Eventually, um, they came to an abrupt stop when the oil embargo hit. And at that point, uh, the Japanese had a ready stable of, of small cars they could ship to the United States and Europe. And with the embargo, it took several years for the cars to retrench, but they had to retrench drastically and very, uh, very rapidly. But the luxury of the uh, the 50s and 60s were there, uh, and the Ford car was competing to look as luxurious as the Mercury's. And the Mercury's were competing to have the same kind of luxury, if possible, as the Lincoln's. And the same thing happened at General Motors. The um, Chevrolets wanted to have some of the luxury of the Buicks and, and the Pontiacs, and the Pontiacs and the Buicks wanted some of the luxury the, the bigger cars, like big olds and the big Buick and the Cadillac. We were, of course, trying to launch off of our own cars at uh, General at uh, Ford Motor and the General Motors the same and we were trying to make our Ford car as luxurious as possible within our Ford budget stretching the Ford budget a little bit and to try to make that little bit count in luxury appearance additionally at Ford Motor we had the four seat Thunderbird towards the latter part of the 50s. And the Thunderbird was a good benchmark for a sophisticated, sporty, personal car. So we too were trying to make our uh, four-door sedan as uh, luxurious as possible, and if possible, lunch off of the uh, Thunderbird. Additionally, during the 50s and the 60s, there was a marked difference in the body uh, appearances of the GM cars versus the Ford cars. The Ford cars, we started out as consultants and kept up the idea that our cars should not be so heavy in sheet metal appearance with big bulbous shapes like the GM sections because they tend to look heavy and weighty and ours were crisp. We called it the crisp look and we added the crisp look to the four seat Thunderbird as well. So we were launching off of some Thunderbird uh, appearance and some of our Lincoln uh, luxury look to our Ford cars and um, we were succeeding. The people liked the Ford car. When the 57 car was designed, Mr. Ford had it shipped to Moscow for their big exposition of products and the Russian people were amazed that this was the working man's car because <laughs> their most luxurious cars didn't even hold a candle to the Ford 57 car. Well, actually what happened on the development of the body sheet metal from 49 throughout the industry, we started out being very conscious of the aircraft design. 
But of course, the very first cars that came uh, from manufacturing and from the car companies uh, were derivative, just one step removed beyond the cars that were there before the war. However, the designers soon afterwards started to implement a lot of aircraft designing to the sheet metal, which stressed the concept of how to draw the sheet metal in the presses and finding new ways of um, having sub-assemblies to get some of these unique shapes on our new cars. For instance, on the 57 Chevrolet, they had an exaggerated deck with a big flying wing uh, deck lead that started in the center and came out into one giant big V. Now, in order to do that, they had to button uh, some panels together and at the buttoning sections, they'd run a molding in body so you couldn't see it. Otherwise, they couldn't draw it. And um, that was a, f a fortunate heyday for uh, Ford Motor at the time because that was the year the 57 Ford car came out and the Chevrolet came out with this big gull wing deck. And the public wasn't quite, they were shocked. And there, were ad, there was advertising run, did you see that thing in the garage? Was it a bug or was it something from Mars? Well, no, that's the Chevrolet. And, um, and then the Ford had a counter thing, you know, get into our Ford. And we too had uh, a wing, we had a fin on, uh, and it was slightly canted, but it came off the taillight in a, a, a normal way, but it was nowhere the size of the Chevy deck lid uh, fins, tail fins, um, on a for exaggeration, nor was it as difficult. Um, the theme of the cars also incorporated shapes like rocket tubes to the body sides. And this is all uh, launching off of the aircraft themes of World War II. And it was it was fad, it was in tune with its time, it was appropriate for its time, it was try anything, the sky's the limit, and all the, comp all the car companies did this. Some uh, designs were more successful than others, uh, some were just too exaggerated. Um, we tried some ourselves and backed off on some, and uh, we never came out with quite the exaggerated fins that were in the industry, but we did our fair share of the fins and we had some rockets on uh, the body sides of the four seat Thunderbird, for instance. And uh, uh, we too uh, were conscious of the themes and it was expected of us and it was in tune with its times. Uh -huh. How did the Mustang Okay, uh, I'll tell you the details on that. Of course, it, it was generated by the Corvair in a sense. Um, I mentioned to you that Corvair came out uh, and finally took a lot of the sales from Falcon because they had this sporty interior, which we did not have at the time on the Falcon. But even so, Falcon outsold the total number of Corvairs, and, and Falcon was by far the best-selling small car of the big three. But that started the things rolling for the Mustang. Additionally, the Falcon uh, was done under the uh, Vice President Bob McNamara. 
and Bob McNamara was also vice president for the 57 Ford, and I didn't talk about that or how that started. Uh, I should have. I, if you want, I'll backtrack to no, that. I think we better go. Okay. Right <laughs> uh, the Mustang program, of course, McNamara uh, left to go to Washington as Secretary of State, and Lee Iacocca came in next as the Vice President of Ford Division. And um, as Vice President of Ford Division, Lee also wanted a sporty car in the Ford Motor lineup. Not necessarily that it would be a uh, Ford Division uh, car only, but uh, it was open whether it be Lincoln, Mercury, or Ford to start with. And so he spent a lot of time with uh, Bordenay in the development of the first ideas and then was getting nowhere because Mr. Ford wasn't buying. And then I'm telling you this before I get into it, and you can cut out what you don't want. Um, when he turned it loose, finally, he said to Bordenay, is getting critical on his timing. Please, Gene, turn it loose to the other studios, production studios, along with your corporate development and have it a three-way race. So Ford then was invited, and Lincoln Mercury was invited to make um, contributions for uh, the competition between Ford, Lincoln Mercury, and the product development private studio uh, that Lee was in with Bordenay all this time and to come up with a car that Mr. Ford would buy. Now, at that point, I was also sandbagging uh, to a program that all certain echelon uh, grades were attending of um, Kepner Trigo on problem solving, problem analysis, problem analysis, problem solving course for one week. And um, I left the very Friday or the next Monday, the program was learned, turned loose and I was not there. I was in a seminar for a week. I was in uh, control with the, at least the phone. What are you guys doing to get started? And the uh, car was going to be started in our studio, which they did. They found a buck, they piled the clay, and the agreement was that in a week that I was gone, when I came back to the studio, they would have a car for me to look at. Okay, I stopped the model. When I came in, the, the car that was started by the fellas in the studio when I came in from my seminar the following Monday, the two other studios were running. Lincoln Mercury had two cars going and the Advance had um, four cars that they had previously had, remodeling, redoing. Lincoln Mercury was doing two, we were doing one. We couldn't afford to do more because of our program load. Um, I walked in the studio, the first one in the building. I got up real early. They let me in, opened, the guard did. And I hot trotted down to the studio and uh, looked at the car. The car had a reverse backlight and uh, I don't know, holy smokes, this is supposed to be a new car. We've got a reverse back like on it, just like the Lincoln Mercury's. That's not new. And we also have it on a Ford Anglia. So, can't do that. I looked at the front end, and that had a low mouth chrome. And at that time, we did not have advanced 
technology for plastic front ends like today to cut the weight out, we couldn't afford that kind of a front end on the high-end Ford car. We could only afford it a facsimile of it on the four-seat Thunderbird. Now, how in the world were we going to win the marbles on this sporty Ford car? It's supposed to be lightweight, short, and uh, with that weight, no way. And the body side didn't have any features to it. So I stopped the car. At that time, one of the managers of the studio came in. It was um, uh, Gail Haldeman. And I said, Gail Haldeman, what happened on this car? And he says, Joe, I, I know, I know. Um, Dave wanted to do this. And I said, well, how many designers were there on this car? Oh, there were about three designers. I said, oh. And then Foster, the other manager, came in. I asked Foster, too, and he saw me from the other side of the room at the studio. And he said, Joe, I know what you're thinking. And I said, yes, I guess you do. And uh, I said, well, at that, I guess we're in agreement then that We'll have to do something about this. And shortly afterwards, Dave Ash, the, my exec in the studio, came in and I said, Dave, we can't do this car. It's too heavy on the front end. We can't even afford it for the high-end Ford. And the back end, I said, you know, it's on the Mercury's and it's also on the Ford Anglia. And we we're supposed to come out with a a brand new car. I tell you what, Dave, I said, cover the car with a tarpaulin, get all the photographs of the past eight months that Gene and uh, Lee Iacocca have done on the uh, uh, sporty car and meet with me and the two managers in my office. Bring all the photographs in and we'll talk about it. So the tarpaulin was put on the car and stopped. They brought in all the photographs and with Dave and uh, with uh, Dave, uh, Gail Haldeman and John Foster and uh, Dave Ash, we had a long conversation. And at the end of our conversation, I said, okay, now I'd like to have all of the designers from the Ford Studios come in to the showroom and uh, the managers of the uh, designers and the execs and let's talk about this sporty car, uh, what this car should look like and what it should not look like. And I'd like to have a total discussion on, on this car. And also, when they're all done, I'll give them what I have been thinking about in the past week myself on this project. But I'd like to get the feeling from the designers first and uh, we'll take it from there. So what happened was immediately after lunch, about 25 designers from the Ford Studios were all assembled in the, um, in the showroom, including the managers and the execs and the head manager of the modeling because it was a big project, I'd stopped it. And um, I had everybody uh, give their opinion and we had set up a, a technique that I picked up in my class of the uh, problem analysis and solving of making the lists of what's wrong with the product and what should be done. And I said, and the last person to speak was myself. And we made lists of everything we were going to do and not do. And one of the things was for sure, we weren't going to do anything that had previously been done or a variation of anything that had previously been done. So all those photographs were put up in our uh, uh, showroom as to what was not to be done. When the designers were all through talking, I said, all right, now I have the lists of what we're going to do and not do. And I want all the designers to contribute designs for the next several days. 
and we'll stop all of our design work in the truck and the design work in the advanced studio and design work in the T-Bird studio and we will all concentrate on this car. But before we do that, I'd like to tell you some pointers, if you will keep in mind for me. I said, I too have been thinking about this car and I've been filling up my notebook uh, and what I was supposed to be listening to on management and drawing pictures just like I did in high school. And I said, what I'd like to see us do is take a uh, <clears throat> cue from our T-Bird and come up with a greenhouse that has a feeling of dignity and um, personal uh, high style to it like a sophisticated personal car. And additionally, I said, I'd like to see us try a front end that's got a Ferrari type mouth with a Maserati type die cast in the center piece. A, a Maserati feel so that it can be recognized on the road instantly. And the die casting, of course, I said, not as big as the Maseratis, but something that will say a three-dimensional center motif in this Ferrari and mouse. And then additionally, would you keep in mind for me, please, an air intake for the rear uh, brakes in the quarter panel to give it some body side appearance change, sporty look. And those were my comments to them. They all went back to the studio and uh, we started designing for two or three days and it turned all those designers loose. We had then culled through the designs in those three days and the fellows did pick up on what I was talking about, uh, air intake on the body side and the idea of a sporty greenhouse derivative from the T-Bird in field, but yet sporty. And I also told him in the showroom, I said, don't come up with any macho car, a field that is strictly for the men. I said, the women are gonna be driving this car as much as the men, and so they, it has to be uh, suitable for the women. So n that was one of our no macho cars on the list we had put out. And this is the way we started. Now fortunately, uh, we had the car stopped. It had all the clay on it. So it didn't take us long. Once we got our theme, we set the theme in about one week. In one week's time, we had come up with the theme. We had started the full-size drawings in one week. And we were ready to roll in clay. I could see the, the modelers were all chafing at the bit. And I even overheard them say, in fact, I just talked to the head modeler who lives in California. I said, Walter, I heard you back in the background saying, I hope to goodness <laughs> they stop talking and give us something to model before long. And uh, we both laughed about it over the phone. Um, so we cut our templates and placed them in the existing clay that was loaded on the clay uh, that the fellas had put together in a hurry. Um, in the week that I was at the uh, um, seminar, and we cut our sections into it and sailed. However, we were way behind schedule now. The Lincoln Mercury was well advanced with their two models going, and we were just now cutting in clay, setting in the clay in the clay, uh, the templates in the clay. And of course, the, 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 uh, the corporate advanced studio, they were rolling on four. And um, in order to pick up our time, we agreed with the head modeling manager, who was Leonard Stubar, that we would work 24 hours around the clock. <clears throat> Three shifts, eight hour shifts, coming in the morning, 
stopping at 5, somebody coming at 5 and working through the night, picking up at 8 o'clock in the morning and starting all over again. Working 24 hours shifts proved to be very grueling. Um, the engineers in the studio didn't have to work quite that long, um, but they too stayed till 9 o'clock. And um, the designers, however, also didn't work beyond 9 o'clock because I wanted them fresh for the following day. Um, <clears throat> but the modelers worked 24 hours around the clock on the Mustang design. The um, Mustang design, uh, when it reached to a certain level where we knew we were catching up now with the other studios as far as completion schedule. At that point, we went back to normal timing. Along with the normal timing also, I said I'd like to have our car called the Cougar. And they designed, the studio designed a large die cast centerpiece similar to a, Maza a Maserati feel in thickness, and they uh, put a cougar in the center of this rectangle, elliptical uh, rectangular shape. And uh, for the front end with a low uh, Maserati mouth. The car, additionally, I said, did, I did not want the car to get lost in the melee of cars in be shown in the courtyard. I wanted this car to stand out. And I wasn't going to paint it, I said, another Easter egg color. I said, I want this car to be painted white because <clears throat> it'll stand out. All the other cars will be greens and reds and uh, blues and It'll be hard for them to describe, but when they look at our car, they'll know, oh, that's from the Ford Studio, it's the white one. And so our car was painted white. At the day of the show, um, all the uh, seven cars were shown, and our car won unanimously the decision of the whole group uh, that this car would be used to be the Ford Sporty car. The, n the name of the car uh, also remained with the model for at least eight months until the time came to finally select a name for the sp Sporty car and actually hundreds of names were um, uh, available and tested, and finally a select number, a smaller list, was shown to um, people in a big show of names showing cars, and not necessarily the car as it was being modeled, but f photographs of a car facsimile uh, photograph of what might be coming out as a Ford car and um, asking the people in comparison with the other sporty cars that were shown, how do you rate this car from um, Ford Motor versus the sporty cars in the survey and what would you call this car? from Ford Motor, and then they give them a list of names to pick for this car from the Ford Motor. Two names came in. First one was Mustang, second one was Cougar, and the other names just kind of fell off the table. And so soon after that, the name then officially ran in the studio uh, as the Mustang. 
And all that changed on the front end was that the cougar came out of the die cast piece and the horse was put in its place. Uh, the horse detailing, incidentally, did not come out of the Ford studio. It came out of uh, Ford Advanced Studio, another studio. It was the corporate project advanced studio we were in competition with. But this was just another uh, Ford uh, Lincoln Mercury studio, advanced, and a modeler there used to making animal sculpture and was sort of a sculptor, sculpted the horse that went into the centerpiece of the die cast where the cougar was. The other changes, there were no other changes on the car, there were no changes on the car as originally approved. Even the cougar stayed for a little while. That came in later, as I just said. But there was only one criticism, criticism from management on our Mustang. Mr. Ford sat in the rear seat of the buck of our Mustang, and he was a tall person, about six foot four himself, and he reached back with his head and hit his head on the rear bow of the C pillar. At which point he so said, I guess we gotta get some more room in here. And I said, yes, sir, we can do that. And he wanted about an inch. And so we gave him, he said, can you do that? I said, yes, we can do that. So we rapidly changed our uh, design appearance to accommodate that one inch, which just changed some uh, contours back there locally, and uh, it was fine. That was the only major change. The other changes that occurred was that the chief engineer saw me and said, Joe, you know you're $15 over the hill on this car, don't you? And, I, and he said, I can tell you where you have $5. You've got $5 in that air intake in the rear for the a rear brake, Joe. I, I'm not telling you, you know, where you're going to take your money out, but you're five bucks there in one detail alone. I said, Henry, I hear you. His name was Henry Grieve. He was chief body engineer at the time. I said, I hear you, Henry. But we'll get it out. So the first thing, of course, that came out was the air intake for the rear brakes. That design stayed as it was approved with the absence of the air duct going into the brakes. The headlamps had the European headlamp that was uh, on the Ford of Europe cars at the time, back in 64. I thought that would look great on our sporty car. There wasn't anything like that in the United States. That finally had to go not so much on cost. It was a little costlier than the seal beam. It was, it went because we could get it validated in all of the states in time. That was a must. And there was no way we could get that headlight validated in all the states in time. So that went. Seal beam came in. And additionally, I was alerted. I had costs in the front bumper. I had put the bumper guards and the bumper together as a sim uh, unit together. And that had to be separated because it was too costly the way it was done. The taillights were costed as three individual cans and they were put together then in one die casting and one can, so that knocked out costs. So that's how we got our $15. Now I'll show you the car as it was approved and as it came out in production. And the um, name changed about eight months later after it was approved and in its final detailing. And all we did was just put in the Mustang and the corral where the Cougar was. Well, that's your question. This is the original uh, Mustang Clay as introduced uh, to management, uh, 81662. 
and this car was unanimously picked as the Ford Sporty car, which eventually uh, came out as the Mustang car. It was totally approved as designed, and with one exception that the uh, rear headroom had to be improved, which we uh, accommodated. Let's You'll go notice back. on the front end of this car, it has the European uh, elliptical headlights that were finally abandoned strictly because they could not meet the validation in all the states. This also shows the air intake on the body side that was actually functional at the time, which we had to abandon for cost reasons. And you can see that the uh, air intake uh, with the three fingers, they were actually functional for air intake to the rear brakes for cooling reasons. Um, it was finally abandoned on cost. Okay, next. The back end of the car was approved as shown with the exception that we did have some added cost to the tail lights, the three tail lights. The final production version, we put the three tail lights in one die casting with one headlight, uh, with one tail light uh, can per side. That eliminated some cost, and you'll notice additionally that the lower bumper panel has dual exhaust, and that proved a little costly, so that was dropped for the single outlet for the exhaust. This is a proposal for one of the uh, ensuing grills for 52 and 3 and 4, but actually this particular design was not used, but it shows you the technique the designers use in drawing the grill before it is modeled and uh, a uh, illustration head-on made of the grill and the car itself. Uh, illustration of the grill detailing. Additionally, you'll see this as an illustration, incorporating it onto the whole car so you can see what the actual car may look like. Now this is a designer's illustration as uh, worked out in the studio. The um, designers are, are highly professional people. They were then too, and they are even more so today. They are usually college graduates with four or five years of, of uh, design training. What you're seeing here is the front end of the Fairlane 500 1957 Ford car. And this um, car proved very successful in sales. Ford <coughs> finally achieved uh, uh, a slight uh, advantage in sales for the first time with the 1957 Ford over Chevrolet. Is that you in that picture, Joe? And the person yes. standing alongside of it is, uh, is Joe Ars, who was the chief stylist for the Ford uh, studio at the time. Drawing, I can see from here dust on the side. Oh. And just at the A-pillar and the... Oh, here? Yeah, there you got it. Okay. Dust. What is, what is this? This is a, uh, <clears throat> a design that I had produced uh, uh, for the Nash account while I was working um, for uh, George Walker as a designer. This was prior to and the year that uh, George Walker's office received the Ford account. Shortly after the Ford account was received, the uh, automobile uh, portion of Walker's contract with Nash was dropped, but he still retained the Nash Calvinator uh, white goods, refrigerators, and stove account. What can you tell me about uh, the the design of this particular Nash. It looks very low and very wide. Uh. This, um, this, I can only say was a, a proposal that was liked by the Nash people. It, you notice it, it has completely um, enclosed front and a better aerodynamics. And um, 
the little detailing at the base of the A pillar at the hood at the cowl was intended as air intake for uh, ventilation. Good, good.